Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to be here and to be here in Israel uh, as well. It's my first time to be here. Um, let me just get my computer going. <clears throat> as Mordecai said, uh, I'm going to be speaking about, uh, actually not just Coptic Christians. You're right, we, we hear something, but I don't think they hear it. Um, but actually the situation of Christians in general under Islam, because I think it's more important to get the the very biggest picture possible. Um, so when I speak about Christian persecution, I believe the two fundamental keys is to begin with doctrine and history, because these are really the backbone of everything. If you want to talk, you shouldn't talk in a vacuum. You should give some context. So when it comes to doctrine, uh, Islam in, its, in, in the Quran, in the Hadith, in, in basically Sharia, the Sharia uh, worldview, is very hostile, fundamentally, to all non-Muslims, but it specifically names two groups, and they are the Jews and the Christians. For instance, uh, Quran 551 declares unequivocally, do not befriend, you Muslims, Jews or Christians, because they are both friends of each other and no friend to you, simply because they are infidels. Another uh, verse that's uh, very pivotal to what's happening with Christian persecution and in fact, what's happening with Israel is Quran uh, 929. And this one basically reads, uh, O you who believe, fight the people of the book. Again, that's once again a code. That's the term for Jews and Christians because they have scriptures, books. Fight the people of the books, of the book, until um, they pay jizya, which is an Arabic word. It means tribute, pay financial tri tribute and live in submission and feel themselves utterly subdued. Now this is closely linked to the idea that you may have heard of, uh, it's, been, it's kind of a neologism, uh, thimmitude, which is really based on an Arabic word, thimmi, thimma, and, uh, it is, uh, and this is, uh, it finds great expression in the Pact of Omar, the second caliph. So after the conquest of the Christians of Jerusalem, in fact, he made a pact with them, and it contains all sorts of debilitations. They are protected, they're guaranteed protection, but they have to agree to uh, X, Y, and Z, and this includes to not building new churches, not repairing old, not repairing old ones, uh, not trying to convert a Muslim. If a Christian converts to Islam, uh, the family has no right to speak, they need to leave them alone, not to have crosses on your church, not to ring bells, etc., etc. So this is sort of the background of the doctrine. Now when we move to history, uh, history essentially is a man one long 1400 year manifestation of the doctrines that I just mentioned. After Muhammad died, uh, in fact before Muhammad died, people usually think of the Islamic conquests as uh, an eruption out of Arabia, but in fact the Arabians were the first to be conquered. And in fact most, what's called the Ridda Wars, after Muhammad, after a lot of uh, Arabian tribes followed Muhammad's banner and then he died, they decided they wanted to break away and they became apostates. And this was the first major scale war of apostasy. And so what Abu Bakr did, the first caliph, is he waged war on them and had literally tens of thousands of Arabians crucified, mutilated, mutilated beheaded until they were forced to come back to Islam. So really the story of Islam and the conquest begin in the Arabian Peninsula itself, which no one really thinks of. We all think of it as some sort of the indigenous Islamic nation. But then of course it spread out into Egypt and into Libya and into Tunisia, Algeria, I'm giving you the modern names of course, uh, Morocco into Spain, conquered Spain. Spain was a Muslim principality for a few centuries. It went eastward into Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, Pakistan, and all of this uh, was conquest by the sword. And we get this information not from disgruntled Christian medieval writers or Jewish writers, but from Islam's most authoritative historians. So this is not something that's open to debate. Muslims themselves boast this. This is what they teach in, in schools. This is what's it, what they teach their children, that the sword of Islam conquered these nations. And again, this is seen as uh, divine um, intervention. This is proof of Islam's um, uh, uh, supremacy to all other religions because God was on the side of Muslims, so, that, so the story goes. And so, in a way, the history, uh, so th that was a little doctrine. I've given you a little history. Um, all these nations were conquered. Um, and so the other idea to keep in mind, and I think you're all very familiar with the word occupation, 
is from a strictly, uh, uh, from a, a strictly honest sense, the, the entire Islamic world is one occupied territory. Because all of those lands were, were other people. Uh, as, uh, as Mordechai said, I'm a Copt, my family's from Egypt, and uh, that was 90%, uh, if not more, Christians. And they were the indigenous people, and they, they embraced it centuries earlier, not by force. In fact, they suffered uh, earlier than uh, when Islam came under Diocletian, for instance, and other persecutors from the Roman Empire. And then Islam came, conquered, and so in a, in a way is not Egypt occupied territory. And in fact, one bishop said this. He had the temerity to say this. There was a conflict between Muslims and, and uh, Christians, and some bishop in Egypt made the <laughs> comment that you're our guests to Muslims. And of course, that created riots, and he had to go in hiding, <laughs> and all that. Even though history, historically speaking, he was perfectly correct. Um, so I mentioned this broad landscape of areas from uh, you know Spain to Pakistan into sub-Saharan uh, 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 sub-Saharan Africa, and these are the areas that were conquered uh, under the sword of Islam. Now, what interests me always is uh, the concept of continuity and demonstrating continuity. And this is one of the things that I like to do, demonstrate continuity. And by that, I mean to show that what's happening today is not something that's being done in a vacuum. It's not some sort of aberration or something that is a byproduct of the 21st century or any kind of political phenomenon. So what I mean by continuity is that the same things that I read in the history books, especially in Arabic history books, many of which are not translated into English, the same patterns that I read that happened in these nations are happening right now. In fact, um, I decided a while back to create a monthly report about what happens to Christians under Islam. And it wasn't long before I realized that from one country to another, they all fit under basic themes. One theme would be attacks on churches. <clears throat> another theme would be, would be the concept of apostasy. Some Muslim wants to convert to Christianity. And that's Christian persecution. He's a Muslim, but he wants to be a Christian. And you're killing him for that. So that's a form of Christian persecution. Another one is blasphemy. You say the wrong thing, or someone is jealous of you, and they want to get you in trouble. And then they say, well, you offended the prophet. And then you go to jail, or you get killed. Uh, uh, forced conversions. Forced conversions, and this is uh, just to show you how these sorts of things are so tenacious. Forced conversion is technically banned. It's, uh, Muslims are very gleefully will tell you that the Quran and Islam does not teach forced conversion. And yet it permeates the whole of Islamic history from the beginning to at the very moment. I'll go read an article in an Arabic, small Arabic, of course, uh, blog, because no one's going to report about this in English. And I'll read about several girls that just got abducted, Coptic girls and uh, you know, forced to convert, and then they're married, and, and they're 12 years old, but the Salafi or whoever kidnapped her says, well, she wanted to convert, as if a 12-year-old girl really understands these issues. And so the continuity has always been very amazing to me. And just to give you an example, I was talking about ancient Egypt uh, or medieval Egypt. There's, here's a quote that I translated myself. Um, I, don't th I, doubt, I don't know if it's in English. I haven't seen it. But a historian, um, the premier historian of Egypt, his name, he's known as Al Makrizi, and he lived around the 1300s. And he wrote basically several volumes about the history of Egypt, the med medieval Egypt, with Islam. So I'm going to read to you just a small excerpt of what he wrote. And, uh, and he writes about uh, one of the caliphs in Egypt who's known as Al Hakim. And he's, uh, he's popular, and I'll get into that, why he's popular. But so this is what he writes, um, so I'm quoting now. And in his time, al Hakim's hardships such as one never saw befell the Copts. He then laid his hands on all the endowments of the church and of the monasteries, which he confiscated to the public treasury, and wrote to the effect to all his provinces. He then burned the wood of a great many crosses. He pulled down many churches that were in the streets of different cities. He then laid, in ruins, <clears throat> laid to ruins the churches of al Muks outside Cairo and made their contents to the Muslims, who plundered, the, who plundered them of more goods than can be told. He, throw, he threw down the convent of al Qusair and gave it to the people to sack. He then set about demolishing all churches and made over to the people any prey and forfeit that they could find, including nuns and women who were in there as slave and chattel. And, um, and, and he continues, and mosques were built in their place. And he, allowed to, and he allowed the call to prayer, the Islamic prayer, from one particular church. And this is, it goes on and on and on. 
But he makes a very interesting point at the end. And mind you, this is a Muslim historian who has no great love for Christians. And uh, so he's fairly objective. He's just recording history. And so after he tells us all this, he writes, um, and under all these circumstances, a great many Christians became Muslims. And that really is the history of the Islamic world. Uh, when people, academics tell you that Islam came and people decided to convert to it because it opened the way and the light and people were just attracted to it, here's a Muslim historian telling you the exact opposite. He's showing you all the attacks and depredations that Christians had to undergo and other peoples and what would happen because they knew, just as they know today, the way out of this is conversion. I leave my faith, I became a Muslim, I joined the winning team. Now, I read to you that excerpt and then I will now go read any day, any given day, I can go and find, in Arabic at least, um, this same story about how a Muslim, uh, Muslim mob attacked the church, ransacked it, plundered it, enslaved a couple of women, took them, dragged them away, destroyed the church, set, uh, destroyed the cross because it was offensive to them. And so I think it's very important to appreciate this continuity because things that have such 1,400 years of continuity are not aberrations. They're not things are, that are going to go away anytime soon. These are real aspects of history that should and need to be confronted. Um, and to continue, uh, some of you who may be familiar, you will tell me, well, El Hakim, the one I was reading to you about, the, the one caliph, he's, uh, Western historians are willing to admit that Christians really suffered under him but they'll always tell you he was a great aberration. And, uh, and he may be, he was a maniac, they say, and you know, no other Muslim did such things. In fact, that's wrong. Uh, any, uh, in fact, to, 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 to verify this, I went and looked at various different caliphs, and uh, one caliph, um, Harun al-Rashid, who many of you may know from the Arabian Nights, who's portrayed as a very colorful and playful um, you know, carnal human being who's given to drink and uh, basically women, he was still pious enough to actually go around destroying several churches, firing Christians from their posts. And so the reason I tell you this is because what I just read to you, this excerpt, I didn't finish it. It said um, El Hakim ended up destroying 3,000 churches in two years. But while this may be an aberration in... Um, in uh, intensity, it's certainly not an aberration in the fact that this kind of thing happened, even if on smaller scales, continuously. Um, so how does all of this fit in, and what, what should be done about it, and what does it all mean? I think there's, uh, there's a couple of levels that are intrinsically and instrumentally important for Christians and Jews. And uh, so intrinsically, I think what's important is that we're dealing with a serious humanitarian crisis by any level. Uh, it, 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 if you want to talk about Palestinians, the issue that's happening right now from one end of the Islamic world <clears throat> to the other, and, um, and this is another key thing to, to remember, this is why I wanted to expand my talk and go beyond Copts, because when you see, um, when you see Nigerians burning churches and screaming Allah Akbar, Allah is great, and killing Christians, and then you see Sudanese doing the same exact thing and Somalis, and then you go up and you see Arabs, Egyptians saying the same exact thing. But then you go to Turkey, you know, they're doing it. And then you go to Persia, same thing. Then you go further east, Pakistan, Indonesia. We're talking about people who do not share the same race, they do not shame, share the same ethnicity, they don't shame, share the same language or culture. What then do they share that helps manifest these identical patterns? Obviously Islam, because this is the only thing that those different countries share together. So this is a very ironclad, ironclad issue that's occurring right now, and it is a humanitarian crisis, but if you connect the dots, you start to understand the significance of it. It's not just some temporal aspect that's a byproduct of any, and this is how the Arab-Israeli conflict, of course, is, is portrayed. It's seen as a, a political thing, and that's one of the problems, and this is what I'll get to. So the first thing is intrinsically is the humanitarian crisis, which really, it's one that would make the Palestinian issue seem like a non-issue entirely. <clears throat> if the media, and here's the other thing, uh, we were talking yesterday about um, mainline Protestant churches. And while, if what I'm telling you is true, I also know the liberal media won't want to report it for the simple fact that this is the one wrench in their machinery, in their narrative that ruins everything. Because if Muslims attack Israel, 
with, and shoot rockets, the narr- it, it will be brushed aside. Why? Because Israel is stronger and the Muslims are the underdog. And therefore, the narrative is such that Muslims are doing this because they're oppressed and they're frustrated and they have no other option. So they do this and ultimately it's Israel's fault. Then you go to Europe and you see Muslims doing the same thing, rioting, destroying, complaining. Again, you can't, the mainstream media can rationalize it. Why? Because they're the underdog, they're in ghettos, they're upset because uh, you know, the European host nations are tre- aren't treating them fairly, et cetera, et cetera. This will be the narrative. But now when we come to the issue of Christian persecution, what do we make of that? None of this works. None of the excuses and the rationalizations that the media relies on makes any sense because now we're talking about Muslims in their own lands where they're the majority, where they have the power and where they have the influence. And what are they doing? They're attacking and killing the minority for no other reason than pure intolerance to the fact that they're a different religion, Christians in this case. And I think that's why the mainstream media, and I see it, they don't want to report this. And even when they do report it, when something really happens, a big, a big thing happens, for instance, the New Year's uh, attack on the Coptic Church in Alexandria, uh, where I think almost 30 people died. So, of course, the New York Times has to mention this. And you'll get the first line, bare-bone facts, church attacked. And then the next three paragraphs talks about cops rioting, cops angry, and you end up finishing it thinking the cops are the bad guys because they're violent and intolerant. And you forget what, just, what, what prompted all this. So even there, the media plays around with it. So that's why I think, in many ways, if this issue of Christians being persecuted by Muslims was able to be brought up more prominently, it'll be very difficult for all the apologists for, of radical Islam, because it's the one where Muslims are in power. There's no, you can't use the excuse that they do this because they're frustrated or because they don't have any kind of uh, political influence. It's, that, it's their country, and they're attacking sometimes Christians who make 1% of the nation. This is Pakistan's case. Pakistan, I mean, of all the stories that I find, it's usually Pakistan's the worst nation, and there's only 1% Christian. Any number of girls and boys raped, killed, thrown aside. Um, after the movie, you've heard of the movie, the YouTube Muhammad movie? Because Pakistanis know, Christian Pakistanis know how bad it is for them, they actually, right when it happened, went through a symbolic funeral for themselves because they knew what would happen. And sure enough, in the next day, several churches were bombed and attacked and church leaders were attacked and killed and, and riots because it's known. So um, this has to be brought up. And I mentioned the Protestant churches. If the mainstream media won't tolerate this and won't, will hide it, I do not understand why any Christian in any Western nation would not talk about this. If they're, too, if they're too busy or if they're too concerned about Palestinians purely from a humanitarian point of view, then they're hypocrites. Because any time a, a pastor or a liberal pastor comes up and starts talking about Palestinians, his congregation should look him in the eye and say, well, what about the fact that what's happening to these Palestinians, they are doing it, and by they I mean their co-religionists are doing it to Christians around the world. Why aren't you talking about that? Is that not an issue? And what's happening to Christians around the world by their fellow Muslims of the Palestinians is much worse on any number of levels. And so I think, at least with Christians, they can be put on the spot, uh, Christian leaders of these liberal mainstream Protestant organizations. It needs to be thrown in their face. Every time they open the Palestinian issue, it should be thrown in their face. Well, what about the fact that people who believe in our doctrines are dying and you don't talk about it? Now, so that's the, 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 now how does this come and help Israel? And this comes to the instrumental aspect of all this. It helps Israel, one, because if this becomes more prominent, if pastors are forced to talk about it because it's such a human atrocity that's going on and it's becoming more and more endemic, um, it should take the spotlight off of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which really, when it comes to the humanitarian question, is in- entirely insignificant compared to what's happening to these Christians. I mean, right now, uh, they talk about dislocated Palestinians. In the last two months, in Mali, tens if not hundreds of thousands of Christians were shoved out by Islamic extremists. In Sudan, you know what's going on there, and all of these mass migrations of movements. Egypt, it came on Reuters. They finally talked about how in, uh, in the Sinai, a family was driven out. But the fact is, in very many different Egyptian areas, this has been going on. It's probably been seven times where Muslims riot over some reason, and the next thing you know, an entire village of Christians is emptied, and they're dislocated, and they have no place to live. 
And it's a, it's look at Iraq. After we got rid of Saddam Hussein, half of the Christians are gone, dislocated. Syria, we're Bashar Assad, bad, bad you know, autocrat. And who's the uh, opposition? Well, it's the Islamists. And what are they doing? They're attacking, killing Christians. A, a big chunk of them are gone. Entire cities are gone. So we have all the... Uh, so it amazes me that we can sit here and with a straight face talk about humanitarian concern for Palestinians when this is going on. This is just... I mean, it's ludicrous. And the hypocrisy is, just, is beyond belief. So I believe it needs to be brought up. And if it is brought up, it takes the spotlight away from the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is so insignificant and may be helpful, at least to Israel in that way. The other way is when one begins to understand the uh, totality of Islam's approach to the non-Muslim, and in this case, Christian persecution and what's going on, I think it's important to start, th then you start, and this is how I see it, I don't see the Arab-Israeli conflict as about land, and I don't see it about any political or temporal thing. I see it as another manifestation of what I'm telling you about. Because as you saw earlier, I read these verses, and both and the verses of hostility weren't against Christians. It named Jews and Christians. So this is another manifestation. The Arab-Israeli conflict is another manifestation of what I'm telling you about has, is happening to Christians. But it's a different form, and it's more violent. Why? Because Israel is the dhimmi that got away. All these other groups, the Christians, are living under Islamic hegemony, they can't do anything about it. They're out, outpowered, outnumbered, and so they have to suffer. But Israel, not only is it not in that position, it's in a position of authority over Muslims, and that is a great affront to the entire Islamic world. And so it's important to really see that the Arab-Israeli conflict is not an isolated thing. It's actually a part of what I'm talking about. I talked about Mali. I talked about Pakistan. I talked about Sub-Saharan Africa, Turkey, Iran. And this is how one should start seeing Israel. It's another manifestation of the same exact Islamic hostility that goes back and has doctrinal backing and has historical backing. And, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's not changing. So I hope that was somewhat helpful. But I'm kind of limited on time. So I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. I can take maybe a couple of questions. We, perhaps we could have time for two questions, not more. Yes. Very quickly, what do the cops want from Israel? What, can, what do you think Israel can do to help you or can't do? And if you uh, would uh, spend a, a word or two about Coptic anti-Semitism, because it seems to me from what I, what I read, the cops in Egypt are no friends of the Jews either. Right, OK. Uh, the first question is as to what can Israel do. Um, a, lot, a lot of what I talked about, of course, is trying to get the, main, the media to help. So if Israel has any way to help these stories to get out to a broader public, that is very helpful. Okay. Uh, as to your second question, um, the situation, and I know this now from experience, okay? I understand that you, there's, two, there's two aspects to um, anti-Israelism or anti-Semitism. Uh, anti One is Arab nationalism, and that, that precedes the Islamic fundamentalism, which came about later uh, in the 70s. Then there's the Islamic fundamentalism, okay? Now, Arabs, Christian Arabs, they were the biggest proponents of nationalism because it helped them, because it pushed away the Islamic identity where people are classified by religion, and it was now classified by a nation. We're Arab speakers. I'm a Copt, I'm an Arab speaker. You're a Muslim, you're an Arab speaker. Let's all be one nation. And, and, and so that was kind of what Christians wanted to do. So the anti-Israelism is just part and parcel of Arab nationalism. And so there's a lot of cops who must toe that line. And it's not articulated from, for example, a, uh, uh, we were talking earlier about um, uh, replacement theology. It's not that. It's nationalism in that sense. The other problem is now we come to the Islamic fundamentalists who are, in more, who are more prominent. You, you, I mean, if you, you should know this. Israel is arch enemy number one in these areas. Okay? And now you have these cops who are being persecuted, as I've already told you. For them to come out and say anything positive about Israel is called suicide, honestly. It's just, I mean, because they're already being under attack. To say anything good about Israel is to say, is to just declare you're a traitor. Even, even, you're even worse now. You're not just a Christian, dimmi, 
you're even a traitor. I mean, this is how it's seen. Now, when these cops come to America, where I'm at, and I talk to them, it's a complete different story. They think Israel, I mean, what they, and this is actually my father, I remember this. He would love to sit and watch the you know, Arab-Israeli conflict when I was younger, 73 war, and he'd be rooting for Israel and just, and just saying very uh, words I don't want to mention, but kind of like, yeah, kick their butts. You know, he's happy to see this happening, okay? Now, if he was in Egypt, he wouldn't be doing that. He wouldn't be saying that audible. So I think we have to kind of be realistic and understand that they're in a very negative, they're in a tight position as it is for themselves. And so they kind of have to play, play the game. They have to toe the line. They have to maintain that certain thing. But when I, again, when they're out of that environment, it's never like that. I've never met a copt or any Middle Eastern Christian who's now in America or in the West free who harbors any kind of resentment to Israel. In fact, instead, they're seen as the ones, that's why I was telling you, Israel's the one dimmi that got away, that they want to emulate. So. One more short question. Confirm and illustrate what Raymond has said. I just got a report on my my uh, mobile phone that uh, a, a Christian a Coptic church in Egypt has been occupied by Salafis who went and prayed. To take it over. Yeah. Now they're, they're, they've renamed it a mosque. Yeah. And so these things are happening. It's by the day. day. So it's by the day. Worse. Yeah. But my question is, uh, everything seems to have gotten worse in Egypt since the the bar fell. Mm -hmm. What are, are you, are the cops in America doing to try to influence the U.S. Congress and the State Department and public opinion there to look at their plight, at the plight of the cops in right. Egypt? What are the cops in America trying to do? Are they working for that? Yeah, we are. I personally have testified before Congress specifically about the cops. I write a lot about them and, and people invite me to speak and I know other, act, I mean, there's more active type people who are involved in this, so we're trying. But it's also a delicate thing too because and it, and it goes back to what I was discussing, you know, the more we talk, the more they get attacked. It's this collective, you know, punishment identity. Or, or I, you know, that movie, the Muhammad movie, they say it was some cop who did it, okay? And so next thing you know, cops are being attacked just because of this one guy who's living wherever in L.A. made a movie. So it, it, it has to be balanced because the more, the more vociferous we are, it's good, but it's also negative because then news reaches to them I just read recently someone forwarded me in Arabic media all about me and how I am this person who is just turning Western opinion against Egypt and I'm doing all these terrible things, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, and I'm making it worse for cops because, you know, the, the, the story. Waves. So, yeah, I'm making waves, exactly. I'm an agitator. Uh, so it's kind of one has to balance it as best as one can. Thank you very much. Thank you.